Hi there, I'm Craig Cole. From bi-directional charging to power inverters, Chatamo connectors to the 80% rule, there's a lot of EV-related terminology you may not be aware of if you've only ever driven vehicles powered by internal combustion. To clear all this up, we created EV Basics, a series of videos to help you understand electric vehicles. In this video, we're explaining the difference between kilowatt and kilowatt hour. Despite their similar names, these two terms are completely different. Kind of like the countries of Slovakia and Slovenia. Nope, they are not the same. I just checked. Get it? C-Z-E-C-H? Like the Czech Republic? <laughs> oh, that's a geography joke. Okay, kilowatt versus kilowatt hour. These are very similar terms you may have heard of while shopping for an EV. One is abbreviated KW and the other KWH. But what's the difference? Well, here's the simple answer. Kilowatt expresses a rate of energy and kilowatt hour represents the storage of energy. The number of kilowatts is how fast an EV can absorb or put out energy, while kilowatt hours is how much of that energy a vehicle can hold. Let's dig a little deeper. First and most importantly, the kilowatt is used to express the rate at which EVs charge. When DC fast charging, the Ford F-150 Lightning, for instance, tops out at about 150 kilowatts. That's the quickest rate this truck can absorb energy. In comparison, the Nissan Leaf hatchback tops out at just 100 kilowatts, which is appreciably slower. In this context, think of kilowatts as a garden hose. The larger the diameter, the more water can flow through at a given time. When getting ready to top up your EV at a public charger, you'll see kilowatt ratings displayed on the units themselves. And this helps you select the best charger for your EV while leaving more or less powerful chargers for other drivers. I mean, there's no sense plugging your Nissan Leaf into a 350 kilowatt unit if the car can only take in 100. Save that charger for a Hummer EV pickup or Porsche Taycan. Second, kilowatts are also used to express output. While US vehicles are still rated in horsepower, the geekier among you may want to know that one kilowatt is equal to about 1.34 horsepower. Conversely, one horsepower is about 0.75 kilowatts. A rear wheel drive Hyundai Ioniq 5 has a single electric motor that delivers 125 kilowatts of oomph. Multiply that by 1.34 and you get the vehicle's horsepower output, which is 168. So kilowatts relate to charging and motor output, but getting back to kilowatt hours, as mentioned, that term is used to describe energy storage, specifically the capacity of a vehicle's battery pack. Really, this is no different than the size of a gas tank in a conventional car or truck. If kilowatts is the diameter of the hose, then kilowatt hours is the volume of the bucket. Make sense? Great. The Ionic 5 mentioned earlier has a 58 kilowatt hour battery pack, while the Lightning's measures 131. The Ford has a much bigger bucket than the Hyundai, so it can store a lot more energy. But where does this confusing hour stuff come in? That's H-O-U-R. Well, again, this is for the more curious among you. 131 kilowatt hours means the Lightning's battery can deliver one kilowatt of power for 131 hours, or 131 kilowatts for just one hour. Generally speaking, the larger the battery pack, the more miles of range an EV is likely to have, but that is not a guarantee. Some vehicles are more aerodynamic, others might have more efficient electric motors, but all that is a topic for another EV Basics video. You'll also see kilowatt hours combined with miles to measure how efficient an EV is. Instead of miles per gallon in a conventional car, electric vehicles are rated in kilowatt hours per mile or per 100 miles. The EPA rates the standard range Ionic 5 at 31 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. The Lightning Extended Range is rated at 48 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. Unlike MPG, lower numbers are better, and as you'd expect for a big, heavy truck with a big, heavy battery, it's not nearly as efficient as that low-riding Hyundai crossover. It takes many more kilowatt hours for the Lightning to go the same distance as the Ionic 5. So just to recap, kilowatts and kilowatt hours are very different, but related measurements. One is a unit of power, and the other is a unit of energy. 
Keeping things simple, just think of garden hoses for kilowatts and buckets for kilowatt hours. But when it comes to wireless charging, think Wytricity, the sponsor of this video. Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. Wytricity technology even supports bi-directional and vehicle-to-grid charging, so your EV can seamlessly feed electricity into your home or the broader power network if there's an outage. Wireless EV charging by Wytricity is easy, elegant, and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. For more information, follow the link on screen or in the description box below. Next, let's put what we've learned about kilowatts and kilowatt hours to practical use. Here are three popular EV models. The Polestar 2 single motor, Kia EV6 standard range, and the Chevy Bolt EUV. At 75 kilowatt hours of usable capacity, 58 and 65 respectively, the Polestar looks like it can hold the most energy and thus go the farthest. And in fact, it can at 270 miles of range versus 232 and 247 for those other competing EVs. But how easy will it be to refill that big battery in the Polestar or either of those other vehicles? Well, here are the peak charging rates. And they vary wildly, as you can see. Now that we know the difference between kilowatts and kilowatt hours, you can make a pretty good guess that the lower kilowatt ratings on the Polestar and Bolt will leave you waiting a lot longer than the EV6 while DC fast charging. Nifty, eh? Or maybe not if you drive a Bolt. And now you know the difference between these two confusing terms. Like finding out why flight attendants never drink the coffee on board aircraft, range anxiety is terrifying. But it doesn't have to be. Thinking about getting an electric vehicle, but you're freaked out by making the switch? Well, don't worry. EV Basics is here to get you up to speed. And today we're talking about range anxiety, something that many drivers worry about, and rightfully so. Range anxiety is the fear of running out of juice in an electric vehicle and not being able to make it to your destination or to a charger. This is a major challenge, mostly because of how long it takes EVs to recharge. I mean, you can't just fill a bucket with electricity and then pour it into your car's battery like a fuel tank. Last I checked, it doesn't work that way. That's not how it works, right? Okay, just wanted to make sure. Unlike internal combustion powered vehicles that can be topped up in just minutes, EVs have to recharge, which depending on the model and power source can take anywhere from just a spell to forever and a day. If you run an electric vehicle to empty and you're not near a charger, you're also out of luck. If your drive home isn't downhill, you're going to need a tow or at the very least, an EV rescue charger. Range anxiety is a real concern, but there are a few simple things you can do that make it basically a non-issue. Here are some EV Pulse certified tips and tricks so you can drive an electric vehicle without bricks. I like how that rhymes. It's really nice. Okay, above everything else, our number one suggestion is this. Get an EV with more range than you think you need. If you frequently drive to your cabin and it's, say, 200 miles away, don't get an electric vehicle that can go 250 miles between charges. Yes, that technically works and will probably be fine, but if you can afford it, get the model or trim that offers, say, 300 miles of range. That extra buffer gives you flexibility. If the weather's freezing, you have to take a detour because of a crash or road construction, or if your vehicle is overloaded with cargo, you might have trouble reaching your destination without charging along the way, and that is no fun. Speaking of frigid weather, if you can, look for an EV with a heat pump based HVAC system. This is our second tip. In the cold, these designs are much more efficient than resistive heaters, which work like hair dryers and gobble up electricity. Regardless of the HVAC system employed, cold weather negatively impacts EV range, but heat pumps can make a big difference in how far you can go between charges. 
Suggestion number three for reducing range anxiety is to pay attention to the wheels and tires your electric vehicle comes with. Believe it or not, these components have a massive effect on range. Don't believe me? Well, here's some food for thought, a little snack. The high-performance BMW i4 M50 Grand Coupe is EPA rated at 270 miles of range when fitted with 19-inch wheels. It's not too shabby. Then what happens when you opt for 20s? Well, a lot. The estimated range plummets to just 227, a difference of 43 miles just because of the wheels and tires. It's the same story with the Audi e-tron S. When fitted with 20-inch rollers, this all-electric utility vehicle offers 208 miles of range. But if you get 21s or 22s, that estimate drops to just 181 miles. The moral of the story is this. Keep an eye on the wheels and tires your EV comes with, because it really matters. Hey, for more information about electric vehicles, check out our EV Basics playlist, where you will find additional explainer videos like this one. Also, if you like what you see, please subscribe to the EV Pulse YouTube channel. It helps us out so much. Thanks again. Remember the main! Of all the armored cruisers that sunk in Havana Harbor and sparked the Spanish-American War, it is pretty much my favorite. When driving an EV, you should also remember the weather. Cold temps have a huge impact on batteries, which can really ratchet up range anxiety. Basically, be aware that if it's cold, your EV will not go as far between charges. Internal combustion-powered vehicles also see efficiency reductions in the cold, so it's not just an EV problem, even if it impacts them significantly more. There are loads of variables to consider, but according to testing done by AAA, in 20 degree Fahrenheit weather, electric vehicle range was reduced by up to 41% when the heater was cranked up. That's obviously a huge reduction, so plan your trips accordingly. As mentioned earlier, getting a vehicle fitted with a heat pump can help minimize range reduction in cold conditions, as can scheduling a departure time, our number five tip. To mitigate cold conditions, park your EV in a garage if you can. Beyond that, when old man winter bears his icy fangs, try to schedule a departure time. This is a feature many electric vehicles offer, and it's one that can really improve efficiency. If you leave for work every day at, say, 7.30 a.m., you can tell your EV to be ready when you are. It can have the battery warmed up for improved range, and it can have the climate system dialed into your desired settings. You want the seat heater on full blast and the defroster set at 68 degrees? That is an option. Best of all, it does this using electricity from your house instead of depleting the battery. To help reduce range anxiety in cold weather, shop for an EV that offers schedulable departure times. Your anxiety and extremities will thank me. But now I have to thank our sponsor, Ytricity. You connect to the internet without a cable and you can wirelessly charge your smartphone. Why do you still have to plug in your EV? Well, the truth is you don't. Wireless charging technology from Ytricity makes electric vehicle ownership simpler and far more convenient. Just park and your EV starts charging automatically. There are no bulky cables or clunky connectors to wrestle with. The system is also safer than plugging in, and it's just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. You're going to want Ytricity wireless charging in your next EV, so for more information, follow the link on screen or in the description box below. Helping assuage range anxiety, our final tip is preparation. In fact, you can call on Captain Plan It if you need a hand, he's taking disorder down to zero. Charge! Road tripping in an EV can be stressful, especially in less densely populated regions because there are fewer charging stations and you never really know whether they're going to work as advertised. We've seen it plenty of times. Planning your drive and, if possible, being aware of alternate charging locations can make life a whole lot easier when you're far from home. Of course, many EVs offer automatic route planning that does most of the work for you, but it's still a good idea to verify where you need to stop and charge before hitting the road. Services like a better route planner, yes, that's what it's called, are highly recommended. 
Additionally, apps like PlugShare use crowdsourced data so you know if a charger is working or not. And if you haven't already, it's also a super smart idea to install smartphone apps for the charging networks you need to use and then sign up for their services beforehand. That way you're not forced to register for ChargePoint, EVgo, Electrify America, or Craig Cole's definitely not going to steal your credit card number network while you're waiting to juice up your vehicle. Our app is now available for Windows Phone. Teslas are incredibly smart at route planning, probably the best in the business, and with the automaker's unrivaled supercharger network, driving long distances in a Muskmobile is nearly as convenient as with an ICE vehicle. I'm critical of this automaker in some ways, but they have worked very hard to make DC fast charging seamless, not just another EV pain point. So that'll do it for this installment of EV Basics, and what did we learn today? Well, to help mitigate range anxiety, you should get an EV that can go more miles on a charge than you think you need. Getting a vehicle with a heat pump based HVAC system is a great idea. Wheels and tires have a massive impact on range. Weather conditions matter a whole lot too. You should schedule your departure times to maximize range. And finally, plan out any long drives so you don't roll up with 1% in the battery to a charger that was decommissioned years ago. Range anxiety is a major concern, but common sense and a few simple steps can make the electric life much more enjoyable. Plus, things are only going to get better as the charging infrastructure improves and battery technology advances. There are rules for everything. Pay your taxes, wear pants, don't drive on the sidewalk. Did you know that's frowned upon now? And if you own an electric vehicle, you need to be aware of the 80% rule. So grab your W-2, don some jeans, and stay on the asphalt. This is EV Basics. So 80%. Why is that an important number to know about if you own an electric car, crossover, or pick-em-up truck? Everybody loves trucks. Well, there are two reasons, actually. One has to do with charging performance, and the other with battery longevity. Here's why. Most of the time, you should only charge an EV to 80%. That's because, one, charging rates slow down dramatically past the 80% mark, and two, the long-term health of your vehicle's battery pack is improved when kept to less than 100%. So what does all this mean? Well, let me explain. To the point about charging rates, a good for instance is the lovely Hyundai Ioniq 5 with the optional long-range battery. This hatchback-like crossover can DC fast charge from 10 to 80% in an incredibly quick 18 minutes, and that is an accurate figure one we verified in testing. Check out our EV Pulse charging challenge video for all the details. Just click the link above or in the description box below. But do you know how long it took to get the last 20% to totally top off that Hyundai's battery? I'll tell ya. The Ionic 5 needed an additional 32 minutes to go from 80 to 100%, almost twice as long as it took to go from 10 to 80. Now, why is that? Well, charging is not linear. I wish it were. Instead of batteries taking in energy at a constant, predictable rate, the rate actually changes based on myriad variables, though most importantly, the battery's state of charge. Simply put, the fuller the battery is, the slower it absorbs energy. It's all kind of crazy. I mean, imagine if a conventional car's gas tank took longer and longer to fill up the closer it got to being full. It would be kind of ridiculous, but this is the reality for EVs, a legitimate downside with the current battery technology. Fortunately, there are simple ways of dealing with this problem, which is what we're here to share. Now, the best analogy I've heard for why charging slows down is that batteries are like theater seating. When you're one of the first people to enter, it's quick and easy to find a chair. You can just sit down anywhere. But as the theater fills up, it takes a lot longer to snag a spot and sit down. Here in the Limax Cineplex, the electrons are climbing over each other and spilling popcorn everywhere at this point. It must be the opening weekend of What's Eating Gilbert Grape. <laughs> what a mess. I'm waiting for it to come out on VHS. Skip the lines. Listen, I tried coming up with a better analogy like packing a suitcase or adding toppings to a hot dog, but the theater one is still tops. It's super important to know about the 80% rule if you're on a long distance drive in an EV, and here's why. When it's time to charge, it's often smarter to stop at 80% 
then get back on the road instead of waiting for the battery to completely fill up. Doing so maximizes your use of time. Here's an example of what I mean. If your EV has 300 miles of range when fully juiced up, that means it can go about 240 miles with an 80% state of charge. Now, obviously, you're going to stop and power up before hitting zero miles, but let's keep things simple and just say 240. If the zero to 80% recharge time is 40 minutes, you can hit the road in little more than half an hour. Not too bad. Now, if you want to fully replenish the battery, it could realistically take an additional 90 minutes to go from 80 to 100%. In the time it took you to gain that extra range, you could be 100 miles or more down the road and in the vicinity of another charger. That's why stopping at 80% usually makes the most sense, though that is something you have to determine. There are instances where you'll want to wait longer to hit 100%. Maybe there are huge distances between DC fast chargers and you need every bit of range you can get. It could be the dead of winter and you're worried about making it to your destination. You've got range anxiety, something we covered in another EV Basics video. Or let's say you're towing a Tesla on a car carrier and the extra weight means you need the additional kilowatt hours to get to the next Electrify America station. <laughs> nah, that seems unlikely. So unless you're in a specific scenario, DC fast charging to 80% or thereabouts makes the best use of your precious time. But there's another reason to avoid going all the way to 100. Stopping short is a good idea because it can help preserve battery life in the long run. But you know what else is super smart? Wireless vehicle charging by Ytricity, the sponsor of this video. Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. Really, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Ytricity technology also supports bi-directional and vehicle-to-grid charging so your EV can seamlessly feed electricity into your home or the broader power network. Wireless EV charging by Ytricity is easy, elegant and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. I've seen it in person. This is a feature you are definitely going to want. So for more information on Ytricity, follow the link on screen or in the description box below. With an eye on maintaining battery health, charging to 80% makes a lot of sense. It's something you'll probably want to do. Whether it's a phone, cordless drill, or your car, batteries simply don't like to be full. Keeping them topped to the brim means over time, the maximum kilowatt hours they can hold shrinks faster than it would otherwise. Always concerned about warranty costs, automakers even suggest limiting how much you charge. On Ford's F-150 Lightning website, they say, Ford recommends that you charge to 90% for everyday driving and charge to 100% when you need the full range for a trip. Charging to 90% helps prolong the life of your battery. With its iX utility vehicle, BMW has a similar advisory in the owner's manual. To optimize the service life of the high voltage battery, keep the charge level between 10 to 80% if possible by setting a charging target of 80% and blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of other stuff there, but you get the idea. Sure enough, car companies make this easy to do, so forget having to yank the cord out at 3 a.m. when your Tesla hits 80%. Most EVs have a place in the infotainment system to set your preferred charge level, and even whether you want to allow higher maximum charging when you're not at home. Of course, rules are meant to be broken, except driving on the sidewalk. I learned that one the hard way. I mean, those kids shouldn't have been outside playing. Certainly not at lunchtime. Anyway, Yes, you can absolutely charge your EV to 100%, and I'm not telling you not to do that. It's just that for optimal battery life over the long haul, charging to a lower percentage is a very good idea. It's kind of like changing engine oil in an old school vehicle. You can follow the manufacturer's recommendation, but doing it more frequently is never a bad idea, especially if you plan on keeping your car or truck for years and years. It's cheap insurance, <laughs> like keeping up on the ins and outs of electric vehicle ownership with EV Basics. Coming up next, everything you need to know about electric vehicle chargers and probably a few things you don't. But hey, that's what chapters are for. 
This is EV Basics, where we aim to educate and entertain. And I'll tell you, you won't find better edutainment for the price. Just six easy payments of $39.99, plus a small minimal processing fee. That gets you complete access to the entire EV Basics LaserDisc set, plus an autographed copy of my latest novella. Craig, these are all available on YouTube. Anyone can watch them. What? The videos are free? N nobody told me that. And stop hawking your book. How are the kickbacks supposed to work then? All right, EV charging. There are several ways you can juice up your electric vehicle. In this video, we'll cover the three main charging types, plus a bonus technology that's an up and coming game changer. We'll also detail all the connectors you may encounter, but let's start with a breakdown of charging speeds. Level 1 charging is the simplest, though by far the slowest. This uses 120 volt alternating current electricity, or AC for short. Basically, this is what flows from the standard outlets in your home or garage. Yep, one of those. Many EVs come with a level 1 charger as standard equipment, so you can plug in and juice up just about anywhere, like mooching power from a friend or family member when you go for a visit. Sidebar, we may call this a charger, but technically it's an EVSE, which stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. And I think this particular unit was built by Stellantis or something, I'm not sure. Not to get tangled in the weeds, but the real charger is part of your EV's electrical system. This equipment simply supplies the power safely. So know that when we talk about chargers, we're actually speaking of EVSEs. Sidebar ended. Ideally, however, you'll never level one charge your EV because it's so slow. Depending on the vehicle, you'll get three, maybe five miles of range per hour, which in the grand scheme of things is horrible, though it is still better than walking. I view level one charging as an option of last resort, one best left for emergency situations, and about the only case where frequent level one charging makes any sense is with plug-in hybrids. Their batteries are much smaller than the ones in all electric vehicles, so they do charge up a lot faster. In comparison, level two charging is a much better option. It's what you'll probably do every day, either at home or a public location. Level 2 chargers also operate on AC power, but at 240 volts, so they're way more potent. Going level 2 gets you around 30 miles of range per hour with a lot of EVs available today, though this can vary drastically depending on the vehicle itself and how many amps the power circuit feeding the charger provides. Level 2 charging is perfect for everyday use. You get home from work or running errands. You plug in and your EV will be fully juiced by the next morning or much sooner than that if you didn't run the battery way down. Best of all, Level 2 charging does this without stressing the battery, which can be an issue with DC fast charging. More on that in a bit. Now, there can be a downside to Level 2 charging at home, and it's potentially a big one. Cost. You may have to pay for the charger itself, they are usually not cheap. And then, unless you're super handy, you often have to shell out more money for an electrician to install the charger because a new 240 volt circuit may have to be run from your power panel to the place where you want to charge your EV. So be aware of potential additional costs, which can add up to thousands of dollars. However, if you're lucky, the electric vehicle you buy may come with an EVSE that has an option to double as a level two charger by swapping out the plug. Just pull that out, got my level two here. It goes right in the end, just like so. And if you are really lucky, your garage already has a NEMA 1450 outlet similar to this one, what you may call a dryer plug. And if you've got both of these, good news, you are in business, no need to spend more money. That being said, keeping a portable charger in your vehicle is never a bad idea, so consider having one for home and one to go. As mentioned, level two charging is ideal for everyday use. Really, it's the best all around option, but if you are on a road trip and need to juice up your EV, don't seek out a level two charger unless it's the one at your hotel or it's your only option. Though speedy, it still takes hours and hours to replenish the battery. What you want is a DC fast charger. Sometimes erroneously called level three chargers, these power boxes are built for speed. They're like the cheetahs of the charging world. 
Depending on the unit, they can push out anywhere from 50 to 350 kilowatts of juice, enough to replenish a depleted battery pack in just minutes. Attached to an appropriate DC fast charger, cars like the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and Kia EV6, for instance, can go from a 10% state of charge to 80% in just 18 minutes. That's barely enough time to use the bathroom and grab a snack. When DC fast charging, it's also very important to know how much power your vehicle can take. If you drive, let's say, a Volkswagen ID.4, it tops out at 135 kilowatts. So there's no sense plugging into a 350 kilowatt charger. Now, you absolutely can do this. It won't damage the vehicle at all, but it's not going to charge any faster than the maximum rate. Now, the polite thing to do is hook to a 150 kilowatt charger and save the 350 for drivers that can take advantage of all that power. And we have a full EV Basics video explaining the differences between kilowatts and kilowatt hours, so make sure to check that out when you get a chance. Anyway, the speed of DC fast charging is unmatched, but it does have two significant downsides. One, regular use can degrade your vehicle's battery pack, so be aware of that if you plan on making cross-country drives in your EV every other week. And two, DC fast charging isn't cheap. It may still be a bargain compared to gasoline, but you're practically guaranteed to pay a lot more per kilowatt hour than you will level two charging at home. And this makes sense because it costs big money to install a DC fast charger, tens of thousands of dollars or more. And whoever shelled out the cash for that probably wants to make it back. In short, you're paying a premium for instant gratification. Well, nearly instant gratification. Lastly, there's one more option to talk about, wireless charging. As you might imagine, this EV energizing technology requires no cables or connectors. You just park over top a special plate and the system sends electricity right into your vehicle's battery. It's that simple. Wireless charging technology from Wytricity, the sponsor of this video, makes life with an electric vehicle even easier. But beyond the convenience of not having to plug in, their system also supports vehicle to grid and bi-directional charging. So your EV can feed electricity directly into your home's wiring system if there's a blackout or even the broader power grid during times of high demand. Of course, this is something certain hardwired EV chargers can do, but only if they're plugged in. Should you forget to click the connector to your vehicle, you won't get these benefits. Wytricity's wireless charging systems use a technology called magnetic resonance, which makes them just as fast, efficient, and safe as level two charging with a cable. So really there are no downsides to cutting the cord. For more information about Wytricity or wireless charging technology, follow the link on screen or in the description box down below. Also, if you like what you see here, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the EV Pulse YouTube channel for more videos like this one, plus the latest news from auto shows, high quality vehicle reviews, and so much more. We appreciate you guys so much and thanks again. Moving right along, let's now talk about charging connectors so you know the difference between a CCS plug and CHAdeMO. So in North America, there are four types of electric vehicle plugs in common use. Level one and level two charging have the same five pin connector, the so-called J plug or SAE J1772. DC fast charging uses the combined charging system connector, CCS for short. And this looks like the J plug, but with a couple larger terminals added to the bottom. Almost every type of EV sold in America can accept a J plug and or CCS connector, both standards are well supported, so you should have zero issues. Next, there's CHAdeMO, which is an odd looking design that was developed in Japan. This DC fast charging connector is used on very few vehicles. In America, the only car I can think of that has a CHAdeMO port is the Nissan LEAF. So unless you own one of these cars or maybe a Nissan dealership, you're probably not going to encounter CHAdeMO very often. In fact, the newer Nissan Aria doesn't even support this dated standard, so feel free to forget about it right now. Remember when I said almost every EV supports a J-plug? Well, of course we can't talk about connectors without mentioning Tesla's proprietary design, which is everywhere because it's what comes on Tesla vehicles. Elon Musk's configuration looks kind of like the J-plug, but slightly flattened. Because of its unique shape, the Tesla connector only works with Tesla chargers. 
Unlike other EVs, the same plug shape is used no matter if you're slow charging or fast charging. Adapters are available that allow the Model S and its kinfolk to charge at EVSEs equipped with either J-plug or CCS. And while adapters like this one allow non-Teslas to recharge at Tesla slow chargers, no such capability exists for fast charging. Elon Musk's proprietary charging port design is one of the reasons you can't juice up other EVs at a Tesla supercharger, though corporate politics are the biggest hurdle. Someday Elon Musk will open his industry leading charging network to non-Tesla EVs. So you're thinking about getting a new electric vehicle or you just bought one and you're wondering, do I need a dedicated EV charger at home? Well, the short answer is no, but also definitely yes. I'll explain everything after the splash animation. Did it play yet? It didn't. I'm just gonna keep going then. Well. Am I back? Okay. Welcome to another episode of EV Basics powered by Ytricity. So if you own an EV, do you need a charger at home? Well, as I mentioned, the answer is no, you do not have to have one. But if you live somewhere that a charger can be installed, you're almost certainly going to want one. We here at EV Pulse firmly believe you are living your best EV life when you can charge at home and wake up every day with more than enough range to get you where you need to go. Public charging should be the exception, not the rule. That said, let's consider all your options as well as their pros and cons, starting with a free solution. Many new EVs come standard with level one chargers. These plug into your typical everyday 120 volt household outlets, meaning you can use them just about anywhere. Unfortunately though, these chargers are not very powerful. They only get you around three to maybe five miles of range per hour, and that's terrible. Here's a for instance that proves my point. When properly equipped, the Tesla Model Y SUV offers up to 330 miles of range. If you come home with, say, 30 miles in reserve, level one charging could take 100 hours to fully juice up the battery to replenish the 300 miles of range that got used up. <laughs> That's four days, and I hope you don't have anywhere else to go for the rest of the week. Now, depending on where you live, you could rely on public charging instead. You can level two or DC fast charge at stations rather than at home. And this is what EV drivers that live in apartments or other places without a garage have to do. Now, either option is way faster than going the level one route, but there are some downsides. When public charging, you almost always pay more per kilowatt hour than you would at home, unless it's a free perk provided by your municipality. And point number two, DC fast charging too frequently can negatively impact battery life. This is something many vehicle manufacturers caution against, so use it sparingly if you can. And finally, even so-called fast charging can take a long time, up to two hours in some slow charging EVs. So don't buy an EV thinking you can treat Electrify America like a gas station. That's not how it works. Ultimately, the best all-around solution is having a level two charger installed in your carport or garage. These are powerful enough to fully replenish an EV's battery overnight, you pay less per kilowatt hour, your vehicle is nice and safe at home, and you can be doing something more useful while charging, like sleeping, something you probably do most days. Hit like on this video if you're a fan of sleep. Still, nothing's perfect, and there are a couple downsides to level two charging. As we mentioned in another episode of EV Basics, chargers and their installation can be a costly investment. And for those in apartments or condos, installing a charger may be entirely out of the question unless your garage provides access to a NEMA 1450 or 1430 outlet like a clothes dryer would plug into. Some EVs come with combination chargers that support both 120 volt level one charging as well as 240 volt level two charging. These typically have plug ends you can easily swap out. And this is a good solution that can save you the expense of buying a hard mounted level two charger, but you still might have to pay an electrician to run a 240 volt line to where it's needed. If you already have an outlet occupied by a dryer, smart circuit splitters like this one by Splitvolt allow you to charge your EV and dry your clothes without overloading the circuit. 
To decide whether you need a charger, we've developed a list of questions you can answer. But first, ask yourself this. Would you prefer to recharge your EV without plugging in at all? Well, of course you would. You connect to the internet without a cable and you can wirelessly juice up your smartphone. Why do you still have to plug in your EV? Well, actually you don't. Litricity makes this episode of EV Basics possible and their wireless charging technology makes electric vehicle ownership simpler and far more convenient. Just park and your EV starts charging automatically. That's basically it. There are no bulky cables or clunky connectors to wrestle with, which can be a real hassle. This system is also safer than plugging in and it is just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. You are absolutely going to want Wytricity wireless charging in your next EV, so follow the link on screen or in the description box below for more information. To answer my initial question, at the end of the day, you don't need a dedicated electric vehicle charger at home, but let's reframe that. If you can, should you install a charger at home? Well, ultimately that's a personal decision, but here are some additional questions you can ask yourself to arrive at the right answer for you. Does the place where you work, attend school, or otherwise spend the bulk of your day provide free or low cost EV charging? On average, do you drive fewer than 20 miles a day? If so, maybe charging from a household outlet is just fine. Do you have an additional conventional vehicle in your household for times when your driving needs outpace your ability to recharge quickly enough? To the point of affordability, does the EV you're shopping for provide discounted charger installation with a partner company? Chevy, for example, currently offers a deal to Bolt buyers. Do you qualify for local or federal incentives to offset the cost of a charger and its installation? But your time is an equally valuable resource. Are you able to wait, in worst case scenarios, hours to charge? Public chargers are still a limited resource and the number of EVs on the roads is on the rise. So if you plan on primarily DC fast charging, are you leasing your vehicle? If so, the burden of poor future battery life won't be something you necessarily have to contend with. Depending on how you answered these questions, you should have a better idea of whether or not installing a home charger makes any sense. Again, you can get away with using the 120 volt level one charger that came with your EV, or you can rely on public charging networks, but I've gotta tell you, for the best ownership experience, plan on getting a level two charger installed in your garage or carport. That's our recommendation here at EV Pulse. Hybrids and plugins and EVs, oh my. The world of electrified vehicles is overwhelming, but I'll tell you all about the differences between these powertrains in this episode of EV Basics. Wait, that says EV Basics, right? So why are we talking about hybrids? Well, as we are always ready to admit here at EV Pulse, electric vehicles aren't for everyone yet. Today we're providing a primer to help you decide what level of green you're ready for, and believe me, it can be confusing. Automakers, of course, still offer conventional gasoline and diesel engines, but more and more vehicles are available with hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or all-electric drivetrains, which means things get convoluted really quickly. Let's break it all down so you understand what to look for when shopping for your next vehicle. Whether it's hybrid, plug-in, or electric, all these drivetrain technologies have the same thing in common. They aim to improve vehicle efficiency without sacrificing drivability. I and mean, who says you can't have your cake and eat it too? Mmm, <laughs> buttercream frosting, man. Oh, that's good. Mmm. Of these three powertrain technologies, the hybrid category is the most diverse and complicated. To make sense of things, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. Microhybrids are the simplest of all, though it's debatable whether they're actually hybrids because basically this is an engine stop-start system that kills combustion to save fuel and reduce emissions when you're sitting in traffic or stopped at a red light. 
Microhybrids may also incorporate very limited regenerative braking to further improve efficiency. Anyway, when you lift your foot off the brake, the engine restarts immediately so you can drive away as normal. And a lot of people seem to hate stop-start systems, and historically some have been pretty janky, but for the most part I think they're wonderful, especially the newer ones. Moving up the ladder, we find mild hybrids. These incorporate stop-start technology, but also typically have 48-volt electrical systems that enable additional functionality. Now, this usually includes some form of regenerative braking and a slight power boost during acceleration. The e-torque system you can get on the Ram 1500 truck, for instance, also enables longer engine off periods when stopped, which helps save fuel. And then the system improves transmission shift quality because of how it can manipulate driveline torque. It's pretty neat stuff. Oftentimes, mild hybrid systems feature belt-driven starter generators instead of conventional alternators, and this makes these systems relatively easy to retrofit to existing combustion powertrains. Compared to micro-hybrids, mild hybrids give you way more functionality without too much extra cost or complexity. The next step up is where things go off the rails. The finer details of full hybrids, or strong hybrids as they're also known, get very complicated. But at a high level, this electrified drivetrain technology delivers huge fuel economy improvements because of how the system's electric motor, or motors as is often the case, work in conjunction with the internal combustion engine. Full hybrids also offer the ability to drive on battery power alone, though usually only at very low speeds and for super short distances, maybe a mile or two. Vehicles powered by full hybrid drivetrains include the pioneering Toyota Prius and even Ford's Maverick compact truck, to name a couple. Both of these vehicles deliver good performance and exceptional fuel economy. Where things get convoluted, though, is when you start looking at how full hybrid systems work, because there are many different designs. You have parallel hybrids and series hybrids, series parallel, power split, and even axle split hybrids. The hardware required and how power gets routed through these systems to the wheels is often very different and well beyond this video. In addition to EV basics, I mean, maybe we need to start a series called EV Complexities. Oh, sorry, you, got, you guys ready for me? I'm, I'm sitting here eating. Get the prompter set up, let's go. All right, three, two, and one. Next up, plug-in hybrids, which take things to another level. With decently sized battery packs and internal combustion engines, these drivetrains offer far greater electric-only range than full hybrids, plus they give you the flexibility to make coast-to-coast -coast drives without having to recharge. You just run on the combustion engine. Plug-in hybrids give you many of the benefits inherent to hybrids and pure electric vehicles, along with the quick refueling and long range of combustion power. As we slowly transition to an all-electric future, plug-in hybrids are an ideal stepping stone between old and new. Now, compared to other hybrid types, there aren't that many plug-ins available today, but well-respected vehicles like the Toyota RAV4, Chrysler Pacifica, Jeep Wrangler, Ford Escape, and Volvo S90 are all available with plug-in drivetrains. For demonstration purposes, let's take a closer look at the Toyota RAV4 Prime, the plug-in version of this popular SUV. It features a 2.5-liter four-cylinder gas engine matched to some electric motors and, of course, an 18.1 kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery pack. When fully charged, the RAV4 Prime should deliver 42 miles of electric-only range. Now, that's nowhere near as much as pure EVs, but that's still enough for many drivers to commute to work and home again without using any gas. Once you exceed its electric range, the vehicle seamlessly switches over and operates like a regular hybrid, running mostly off the engine. When you're ready to lose the training wheels, though, we have all-electric powertrains, which are the simplest of the bunch. EVs have a battery pack, an electric motor or motors, an inverter, some software to make it all work, and really that's about it. Compared to hybrids, EVs usually offer strong, silent performance and are hands down the most efficient, plus they have far fewer moving parts, which means zero tailpipe emissions and less that can go wrong. 
Despite what some people may say, EVs are not a perfect solution for every driver in all situations. But electric vehicles are the future, and they're going to get better and better in the coming years. Before wrapping this video up, let's recap the advantages and disadvantages of these various electrified powertrains. But first, let me tell you about the advantages of wirelessly charging your EV, a technology offered by Ytricity, the sponsor of this video. Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. Really, it doesn't get any simpler than that. Ytricity technology also supports bi-directional and vehicle-to-grid charging, so your EV can seamlessly feed electricity into your home or the broader power network. Wireless EV charging by Ytricity is easy, elegant, and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. Follow the link on screen or in the description box below for more information. Oh, and make sure to like this video and subscribe to the EV Pulse YouTube channel. Okay, now let's recap the advantages and disadvantages of the electrified powertrains we just covered. Stop start or micro hybrid technology is simple for manufacturers to add to existing vehicles and very affordable. Unfortunately, these systems don't improve fuel economy all that much, but they are a great start. Mild hybrid systems offer extra functionality for a relatively low price premium and should improve efficiency more than micro hybrids do, though the gains are still not usually all that impressive. Full hybrids, aka strong hybrids, are where things start to get interesting. Vehicles with one of these powertrains often deliver incredible fuel economy, and the technology has been proven to stand the test of time. Full hybrid vehicles are smart buys. As for downsides, this drivetrain type does add a lot of cost, and efficiency is usually emphasized over performance. Plug-in hybrids are the best blend of present and future technology, offering a good amount of clean, all-electric range, and typically very good performance. These powertrains are great for long-distance drives, because you can just use the combustion engine once the battery is depleted. The disadvantages to plug-in hybrids are that they tend to cost a good bit more than vehicles with conventional powertrains, and if you don't plug them in, as I'm sure many owners forget to, you miss out on most of the benefits they provide. And finally, we have pure electric vehicles. Iffy public charging networks, cold weather range, and affordability are all serious issues, but EVs offer some huge benefits, from lower running and maintenance costs, to strong silent performance, to zero tailpipe emissions, and more. There's a reason we say they're the future. If you've never owned an electric vehicle, there are a lot of confusing terms, like kilowatt hour, plug-in hybrid, heat pump, and chatamo. No, not you. Another one that a lot of drivers don't understand or even know about is something called bi-directional charging, but it's a feature you are going to want. And today I'll explain what it is, what's good about it, and some of the cons to be aware of. You can go now. So what the heck is bi-directional charging? Well, in simple terms, it's a feature that allows your electric vehicle to feed power back into your home or beyond. Normally, energy comes from your house and goes into your EV when you're charging the battery. But with bi-directional charging, in certain situations, electricity can come out of the vehicle and go back into your house. The power can flow both ways, hence the name bi-directional. But why would you ever want this? Well, it is an amazing feature for several reasons. The single biggest benefit is that bi-directional charging allows your EV to function like a generator. Say there's a power outage. Depending on usage, your electric vehicle could provide enough juice to run your entire household for days. You know, it's easy to forget just how much energy is stored in EV batteries, but take the F-150 Lightning, for instance. With the extended range pack, Ford says this all-electric truck can power your house for three days or 10 if you ration carefully. That's more than a week. This makes bi-directional charging a game-changing technology. 
Also, you never need to worry about having a separate generator, whether there's enough gas in the tank or if it will start when you need it. And of course, with bi-directional charging, crisscrossing extension cords through your house to make sure the fridge and freezer stay plugged in is a thing of the past. Now, I know about whole house generators. They're super nice and they streamline this entire process. However, they run on fossil fuels, which are not clean, and you have to buy them separately, which is another expense and not a cheap one. If you own an EV that supports bi-directional charging, you can potentially save tens of thousands of dollars by not having to purchase, maintain, and fuel a separate generator. Similarly, bi-directional also allows your EV to feed electricity into the broader power grid even if there isn't an outage. Sometimes it's hard for utilities to keep up with demand, like if it's the middle of summer in Southern California and everyone is running their air conditioners. Your car could help with grid balancing, so rolling blackouts or other interruptions are avoided. There are huge benefits to bi-directional charging, but there are also a few downsides, which I'll cover right after a few words from our sponsor. When it comes to wireless charging, think Wytricity. Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. It's that simple. And by Jove, by golly, by directional charging will also be supported by Wytricity's wireless chargers. Their systems also have the significant advantage of always being connected. With competing chargers, if you forget to plug in your EV, there's no way it can power your home. Wireless EV charging by Wytricity is easy, elegant, and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. So for more information, follow the QR code on screen or hit the link in the description box below. Of course, nothing in life is perfect and bi-directional charging has some downsides. The biggest issue is that you often have to purchase separate hardware for it to work. Basically, you need a charger that's smart enough to tell when power is interrupted and then interact with your EV so it can start sending juice into your home's electrical system. Going back to the Lightning, for instance, Ford says you need their 80 amp charge station pro at home charger to take advantage of intelligent backup power, their name for bi directional charging. Now, this hardware does come standard in Lightning's fitted with the extended range battery, but if you want to purchase one, they go for around $1,300 at the time we produce this video. Of course, that does not include installation, which could cost thousands more, nor does it get you the required home integration system, which provides additional hardware that's necessary to make all of this function. So make sure to budget an additional $3,895 to purchase that. Finally, battery longevity is a real concern. If your vehicle is constantly running your household or sending power back to the grid, those charge and discharge cycles will degrade the pack over time. That's a fact. But I wouldn't worry too much about this if you only plan on using bi-directional charging as a generator replacement. I mean, how often does the power really go out? Still, it is something to think about. Anyway, I hope you learned a few things from this exciting episode of EV Basics. And are you still hanging around? Yeah, I saw you earlier. You're not as sneaky as you think. Get out of here. Will electric vehicles destroy our power grid? You know, the immense system that generates and delivers electricity to your home and workplace. Well, this is a common question and we will tackle it head on in this episode of EV Basics. We hear it all the time that electric vehicles are a scam and they're going to destroy our power grid. But is that really true? Well, on the surface at least, this seems like a reasonable assertion. I mean, critics say too many drivers plugging into charge all at once could overload the system and send us back to the dark ages. Shutting down coal and natural gas fired power plants is already leading to energy shortages. Just look at California's rolling blackouts. Renewables like wind and solar are unreliable. And finally, our electrical grid is far too old to support millions of EVs. And that last point is particularly frightening. As reported in a 2020 article from Public Utilities Fortnightly Magazine. <laughs> yep, that's what it's called. 
the U.S. power grid is ancient. Quote, to say that the United States has an aging electric transmission infrastructure is a sizable understatement. The average age of the installed base is 40 years old, with more than a quarter of the grid 50 years old or older, end quote. Now, that sounds bad, and in some ways it is, but despite the age of our power system hardware, at least in the immediate term, we're in a better place than many people realize. Yeah, the electrical grid will not be destroyed by electric vehicles. Our electrical grid is old, and we've been dealing with a, a, a grid that was built ages ago and has not kept up with the times, even for regular stuff. I mean, we use a lot of electricity for everything anymore. So the grid itself needed to be upgraded to start with. And that's exactly what's happening. For instance, the U.S. Department of Energy's Building a Better Grid initiative, which is part of the bipartisan infrastructure deal, focuses on catalyzing nationwide development of new and upgraded high-capacity transmission lines. This is necessary because, according to the DOE, a whopping 70% of our nation's power lines are more than 25 years old. Additionally, Insufficient transmission capacity, especially transmission that facilitates the transfer of power across regions, presents another critical challenge. Upgrades and expansions will be funded by more than $20 billion in federal financing tools so every American can have access to reliable, affordable energy and internet access. These electrical grid improvements aim to enhance reliability and integrate cost-effective clean energy into our national power network to satisfy growing demand from all sources, including EVs. So electric vehicles will, will require some additional power draw from the, from the system, but it's not going to be to the point where it's, it's going to bring down our electrical grid in any case at all. Supporting this, a study published a few years back by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory projects that through 2028, the overall power system looks strong enough to support up to about 24 million EVs. According to Sam, as of last year, there were roughly 292 million registered vehicles in the U.S., and about 1.3% of those are electric, so around 3.8 million vehicles. So it sounds like we have plenty of electrical capacity going forward. However, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory also says that once we get to around 30 million battery powered cars and trucks, things could become a problem if upgrades to our sprawling power network aren't made. The United States electric grid is arguably the largest interconnected machine on the planet. It has hundreds of thousands of high voltage transmission lines. It has millions of miles of distribution lines. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a big machine that's serviced by 9,000 or so generating points uh, that, uh, you know, are publicly held and, and privately held, and uh, some are cooperatives. But as complicated as our national electric grid is, power generation and distribution may not be the real issues for electric vehicles in the future. As it stands right now, the uh, uh, forecast from uh, companies uh, like McKenzie really only forecast about 107 uh, terawatts of electricity being consumed by electric vehicles. And when you consider that currently the grid generates over 4,000 uh, terawatts, uh, you know, which is a billion kilowatt hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a small dent. The capacity of the grid, I don't think is going to be the major problem. As I see it, it's really going to be establishing the infrastructure. And one of the uh, key impediments to that right now is the fact that the transformers that are required for uh, fast chargers, you know, your 150 kW chargers and, and up, um, have a one and a half to two year wait time. Helping address the looming EV charging problem, Jim invented something called the Wind and Solar Tower, a non-grid dependent machine that incorporates a vertical axis turbine with a top mounted solar panel. Power generating devices like this could help utility companies meet future electricity demand while also building resilience into the grid. What could also help is a technology called bi-directional charging. 
And this allows your EV to feed power into your home's electrical system or even the broader power network during blackouts or times of high demand. For added convenience, bi-directional charging is one of the features that will be supported by Witricity wireless vehicle chargers. You know, you connect to the internet without a cable and you can wirelessly charge your smartphone, so why do you still have to plug in your EV? Well, the truth is, you don't. Wireless charging technology from Witricity makes electric vehicle ownership simpler and far more convenient. Just park and your EV starts charging automatically. There are no bulky cables or clunky connectors to wrestle with. And this system is also safer than plugging in, and it's just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. You will want Witricity wireless charging in your next EV, so for more information, scan the on-screen QR code or follow the link in the description box below. But back to the impact EVs will have on the electrical grid. For the time being, at least, it sounds like our power distribution network is more than up to the challenge of charging electric vehicles. Further supporting this point, the growth in new EV sales will not explode overnight. We're not going to completely and immediately switch from fossil fuels to electrics in three months. It ain't gonna happen. We're currently running around six to eight percent of the market, depending on where you are in the country, is being electric vehicles. Uh, there are parts of this country where you'll hardly see an electric vehicle and i drive to work every day and you know see a, it seems like every other car is an electric vehicle here this pr whole transition will take a long time we're only looking at about 40 to 45 percent of the market being electric by the early part of the next decade the transition will take a long time based on those projections power companies have some runway for making upgrades to meet future electricity demands you know, I mean, our utility system is um, uh, is relatively well funded. You know, with their with their uh, financial model, I think that they'll be able to raise the capital that's required to sell electricity, uh, sell additional electricity, and at even higher rates. For an even clearer picture of where we're heading, I reached out to DTE, my local power company here in Michigan, and they had the following to say. We are investing more than $1 billion annually over the next five years to upgrade and modernize the electric grid. And then blah, 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 new hardware will help support increased demand. But here's where it gets interesting. While EVs do not create issues at the current adoption level, there is a likelihood that additional planning will be needed to address loading as EV adoption grows. So DTE knows the electric vehicle adoption rate will increase and that upgrades are needed to meet growing demand. The company would not comment about what's happening at the national level, but other utilities are just as aware of what's coming, and so is the government. The bipartisan infrastructure bill signed into law back in 2021 includes billions of dollars to help clean up, strengthen, and expand our power network in what is touted by the White House as the largest investment in clean energy transmission and grid in American history. Aside from all that, if it's any consolation, this isn't the first time we've gone through a monumental shift in transportation. Something very similar happened around 100 years ago. From the turn of the last century till about 1915, there was a competition between electric vehicles, steam-powered vehicles, and gas vehicles, and it wasn't until the invention of the self-starter and mass production of the Model T that, like, that gasoline vehicles took the lead. It took years to develop our fossil fuels infrastructure. Drilling, pumping, refining, and transporting petroleum on a national scale didn't happen overnight, and our electrical network faces similar challenges. I am optimistic that the grid itself will be upgraded. It will take time. These, these things move so slow. Uh, we, we talk about the glacial pace of, of things in the automotive industry, but it, it works in a lot of big industries like, like electricity. Entrepreneurs around the world come up with great ideas on uh, power generation, on power transportation, on all these needed parts of the, of the grid. And I fully expect all of them to step up and say, here's the greatest and latest new thing to, to upgrade our system and provide better power and better electricity to your home. Simply stated, if we were to wave a magic wand tomorrow and convert every vehicle on the road to an EV, the grid would not be ready. It would crash. 
But that's not what's going to happen. We are decades away from full-scale EV adoption. You know, I, I have no doubt that the utilities will be able to, to meet the load. I have very serious concerns about uh, the near and midterm of being able to establish the charging infrastructure that's required to provide the convenience that we've become accustomed to in you know, filling up our tank in three minutes. So will EVs destroy our power grid? Well, it seems like the answer is no, they will not. Despite its age, our electrical network still has capacity and there's room to grow. Big investments are being made to produce and distribute more electricity. Future energy generation and storage solutions are being developed all the time. And finally, the EV adoption rate is projected to grow at a reasonable pace, so utility companies have time to upgrade their systems. Despite what certain cable TV pundits and politicians might say, it sounds like we're in a good place and things should get better going forward, so there's no need to worry about living in the dark ages. All vehicles need maintenance, even electrics. But did you know EVs generally require way less service than conventional gas or diesel-powered cars and trucks? It's true, and I'll break it all down next, but not like a, like a breakdown breakdown, because those usually don't happen with proper maintenance, and I'll tell you, we run a tight ship around here. Please don't call OSHA. Ooh. I think we're good. This is EV Basics, where we demystify the oftentimes confusing world of electric vehicles. So routine maintenance, you've got to do it if you want your stuff to work properly and last. With combustion-powered cars and trucks, this is as streamlined as it's ever been. Modern vehicles are frankly phenomenal, but you have still got to pay attention to spark plugs, timing belts, oxygen sensors, and fuel filters. Plus, there are oil change intervals, transmission flushes, and much more. With EVs, all of that is eliminated, which saves time and money. Of course, this is not to say that electric vehicles require zero maintenance. It's just that service is reduced. Take the 2023 Chevy Bolt EUV, for instance. Aside from recommended multi-point vehicle inspections, the owner's manual says you need to rotate the tires every 7,500 miles, change the cabin air filter every two years or 22,500 miles, you're supposed to drain and fill the coolant circuits at five years or 150,000 miles, the brake fluid should be changed every five years, the AC desiccant is good for seven years, and then, and this is a weird one, you're supposed to replace the hood and hatch support struts every 10 years or 100,000 miles, and I guess you don't want either of those swing panels hitting you in the head. But really, that's it for manufacturer recommended maintenance. And if you look at a Ford F-150 Lightning or the Tesla Model 3, their care and feeding instructions are broadly similar to the Bolt EUVs, which is no surprise. Aside from the fundamentals, some elements of EV maintenance are identical to gas-powered cars, including much of what I mentioned earlier. Of course, wiper blades still need to be changed and the washer fluid reservoir filled. The 12 volt lead acid battery that runs accessories like the power windows and radio will eventually go south and the door latches still need lubrication. Brake pads and rotors are another shared maintenance item, though these components on EVs generally need far less service because of regenerative braking, which improves range and dramatically reduces wear and tear. But undoubtedly, the biggest maintenance concern with EVs is tire wear. Electric vehicles tend to be a lot heavier than similarly sized combustion powered cars and trucks. Plus, electric motors can deliver a huge sucker punch of torque right off the line. And these two factors contribute greatly to accelerated tire wear, so you're going to want to keep an eye on your vehicle's rubber and make sure to rotate those tires regularly. But it's not just that. EVs often run special tires, ones with lower rolling resistance to help reduce range losses while driving. These tires tend to be beefier in order to cope with the extra weight and added forces, so replacement rubber for electric vehicles can sometimes cost more. Still, even if new tires are pricier, EVs can still save you money on maintenance, and we'll highlight what this means for your bottom line right after this. When it comes to wireless charging, think Wytricity, the sponsor of this video. 
Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. Electricity's advanced technology will even support bi-directional and vehicle-to-grid charging so your EV can seamlessly feed electricity into your home or the broader power network if there's an outage. Wireless EV charging by Wiretricity is easy, elegant, and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. For more information, scan the QR code on screen or follow the link in the description box below. Okay, so EVs require way less maintenance than ICE vehicles, but how much money can that actually save you? Well, it depends. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, scheduled maintenance for an EV will cost you about 6.1 cents per mile, while an internal combustion-powered vehicle totals 10.1 cents, and that's a savings of about 40%, which is not insignificant. And if you don't trust the government, AAA came up with pretty similar numbers. The organization estimates it costs 7.7 .7 cents per mile to maintain an EV, compared to 9.55 cents for an ICE vehicle. And over the course of 13,500 miles, roughly how far the average American drives each year, that represents an annual savings of nearly $250. Applying the same math to the U.S. Energy Department's figures I mentioned earlier results in an approximate yearly savings of $540, a much nicer number. But keep in mind, this figure is only for vehicle maintenance. It does not include the cost of electricity compared to gas or diesel, nor are we factoring in repair, purchase, or insurance costs. Those are all subjects for other episodes of EV Basics. Are electric vehicles actually cleaner than combustion-powered cars and trucks? We'll answer that thorny and complicated question in this episode of EV Basics. Critics castigate the cleanliness of EVs while proponents of battery-powered cars and trucks proclaim they will save the planet. But who's right? We'll lay to rest the burning question about whether EVs are greener than combustion-powered vehicles in just a second, but right now I will say this. The answer is indisputable, though the process of calculating it is incredibly complicated with lots of math and analysis. Now, before getting to the bottom of this ICE, internal combustion engine, versus EV debate, we first need to understand what we're talking about here. And for this discussion, let's focus solely on carbon dioxide emissions across a vehicle's lifetime. That is from manufacturing to recycling. And of course, this includes all of the emissions produced while a vehicle is driven. I think a cradle-to-grave approach is the only way to do this comparison fairly because it takes into account manufacturing, fuel and battery pathways, tailpipe emissions, and more. Now, to answer the bedrock question of this video, yes, from a life cycle carbon emissions perspective, EVs are cleaner than ICE cars and trucks significantly cleaner. I'll tell you why and explain how EVs get a bad rap in the first place. There's a lot to talk about right after this. Wireless charging technology from Wytricity, the sponsor of this video, makes life with an electric vehicle even easier. But beyond the convenience of not having to plug in, their system will also support bi-directional charging so your EV can feed electricity directly into your home's wiring system if there's a blackout or the broader power grid during times of high demand. Of course, this is something certain hardwired EV chargers can do as well, but only if they're plugged in. Should you forget to click the connector to your vehicle, you won't get these benefits. Wytricity's wireless charging systems use a technology called magnetic resonance, which makes them just as fast and efficient as level two charging with a cable. So really, there are no downsides to cutting the cord. For more information about Wytricity or wireless charging technology, scan the on-screen QR code or hit the link in the description box down below. Okay, so EVs are far cleaner than ICE vehicles. Here's how we know that. 
Looking at data from the U.S. Department of Energy, over the course of its lifetime, a 2020 model year small SUV powered by a conventional gasoline engine is estimated to produce an average of 420 grams of greenhouse gas carbon dioxide equivalents per mile driven. In comparison, a model year 2020 electric vehicle with 300 miles of real-world range is expected to emit less than half the CO2 equivalents per mile, just 206 grams. And that's with the EV being charged using the U.S. average power grid mix, meaning fossil fuels like coal and natural gas are used to generate electricity, along with some renewables like wind and solar. Now, for reference, the U.S. EPA has a nifty power profiler tool that lets you see precisely how electricity in your e-grid subregion is generated. For 2021, the latest data available, natural gas and coal accounted for most of the power generated nationally across all 27 subregions, representing more than 60% of our electricity. But nuclear, wind, hydroelectric, and solar are coming on strong, and combined, about 37% of U.S. power comes from these sources. Aside from data published by the Department of Energy, researchers at the Argonne National Laboratory studied lifetime greenhouse gas emissions produced by both EVs and ICE vehicles, and not surprisingly, they reached the same conclusion. They compared 2020 model year cars with an expected lifetime of 173,151 miles, and oddly specific number, but for their calculations, the gas model returned 30.7 mpg, while the electric had 300 miles of range and was charged with power, having average U.S. grid emissions. So in this model, the gasoline car produces around 375 grams of greenhouse gas emissions per mile driven over its lifetime. As for the EV, its total emissions are only around 150 grams per mile. Here's where I think car buyers get confused, though, and rightly so. Because what's interesting is that while over their lifetimes, EVs are far and away cleaner than ICE cars and trucks, building them is actually much dirtier, a fact critics often mention. Citing research done by the Argonne National Laboratory, MIT's Climate Portal says that because of their battery packs, building new electric vehicles results in around 80% more emissions than producing a similar gasoline-powered car or truck. That's a huge difference! In fact, it's estimated that assembling an 80 kilowatt hour Tesla Model 3 lithium-ion battery, just the pack, creates between two and a half and 16 metric tons of CO2. That's potentially more than 35,000 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. Of course, those come from a range of sources. You may mine for lithium or other raw materials in South America, which takes huge amounts of fossil fuels. In fact, it's estimated that 15,000 metric tons of CO2 are released for every ton of hard rock lithium that's mined. Those materials then might get shipped to China, where they're refined and assembled into battery cells. Of course, that produces more emissions. Those finished components might then be loaded onto another boat and shipped across the ocean to the U.S., which produces loads of CO2. The cells could then take a train ride across the country to an automaker's manufacturing plant, where they finally get installed in a vehicle, which means even more carbon dioxide is emitted. Surprisingly, this process closely mirrors the fuel pathway for gasoline. I mean, think about it. You have to discover exploitable oil deposits, then pump the stuff to the surface, refine it, blend it, and transport it, with carbon being emitted every step of the way, even before the stuff gets burned. Over their lifetimes, gas-powered vehicles are so much dirtier than EVs because setting dead dinosaurs on fire produces loads of carbon dioxide. Here's a fun fact for a little perspective. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, when burned, a gallon of gasoline blended with around 10% ethanol produces nearly 18 pounds of CO2, so emissions add up very quickly. I mean, that's one hell of a chemical reaction. Now, I'm not taking this into account here, but we can't forget it's not just carbon dioxide. EVs emit no hydrocarbons, particulates, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, none of that nasty stuff. Sure, power plants produce emissions, but it's far easier to control at a single source than at millions of tailpipes. And if you still don't believe that EVs are greener, here's yet another data point. 
The U.S. Department of Energy's Alternative Fuels Data Center says that nationally, the average CO2 equivalent emissions for an all-electric vehicle are 2,817 pounds per year, compared to 12,594 pounds annually for a gasoline-powered vehicle. And that means internal combustion is four and a half times worse. Yes, hybrids and plug-ins fall between these extremes. And finally, even if electrics only lasted half as long as gas-powered cars, say 90,000 miles compared to 180, an MIT study still shows that EVs are 15% cleaner than hybrids and miles ahead of comparable ICE vehicles. So there you have it. We covered a lot of data and different estimates in this video, but the big takeaway is that EVs are far cleaner to own and operate than ICE vehicles, even if they can be significantly dirtier to build. With electrics, you're basically paying for the carbon emissions up front, though a lot fewer of them, rather than over the life of the vehicle. And even if they're not truly emissions-free, EVs are still clearly better for the environment. Electric vehicles have a ton of benefits over gas and diesel-powered cars and trucks, but these advantages often do not come cheap. Up next, 10 unexpected EV expenses you need to be aware of. Welcome to another episode of EV Basics, where we demystify the world of electric vehicles. Despite their myriad advantages, EVs do have their downsides, and unexpected expenses can really surprise new owners. The first one to be aware of really isn't a shock, I mean, at least if you can do a little research or read a window sticker, but EVs are often much pricier to buy than comparable gas-powered vehicles, and sometimes a lot more. This is largely because the technology is still relatively new, and battery packs cost a fortune. Tesla has been lowering prices recently, as has GM with the Bolt EV and EUV models, but many electrics are still extraordinarily expensive, like the Ford F-150 Lightning, for instance. The Workaday XLT model with the long-range battery starts around $81,000, including delivery fees. Now, it's a nice truck, but that's insane! In comparison, a stripped-down XLT gas model with four-wheel drive is about 27 grand less. Of course, federal tax credits soften the blow purchasing a new EV may have on your finances. Getting $7,500 back from the government can bring a lot of electric vehicles within reach of average drivers, but you've got to be judicious. Not every EV is eligible for these incentives, so make sure to do your homework. Consult your tax advisor if you have any questions about potential credits, because realizing you aren't going to get the full or even partial rebate is a rude awakening come tax time. Next, EV registration fees are often higher than they are for conventional vehicles, so budget accordingly when it's time to renew your plates. Since EVs run on electricity, not fuel, states don't make any money from the gas tax for maintaining roads, which is why certain fees are higher. A double whammy that goes hand in glove with increased registration fees, EVs often cost more to insure as well. The reason for this is because they tend to be more expensive to purchase than comparable gas-powered vehicles, the technology is newer and therefore pricier, and if a battery gets damaged in a crash, it can cost a fortune to replace. You don't want to be driving around with a dented, punctured, or otherwise beat-up pack because that is a recipe for trouble like a big old fire. Speaking of damage, electric vehicles can cost more to repair, and for the same reasons insurance is pricier. Heaven forbid you need to replace a battery and it's not covered under warranty or by your policy. The Volkswagen ID.4's pack, for instance, has a dealer price of $13,798.45. You think that's a lot? (laughs) The Ford Parts website lists a replacement lightning battery at up to 47 grand. Whose kids need to go to college? Just buy a replacement battery. Now, critics of EVs hammer this point home again and again that batteries cost so much to replace. And they're right. But what they often neglect to mention is that replacing gas engines isn't cheap either. And it looks like a fully dressed, ready to run 5 liter V8 for an F 150 pickup will cost you about 15 grand. 
So only an arm, while the lightning's battery goes for an arm, and a leg, and your firstborn child. Going forward, the replacement costs for EV batteries will almost certainly drop as more companies develop solutions. Similarly, many drivers don't buy a new engine if theirs fails, they get a used or remanufactured unit instead. The same is happening in the electric vehicle world. In fact, some refurbished packs are already available for more common EVs, such as Teslas or the Nissan Leaf. But now I've got to take a moment to thank our friends at Ytricity, the sponsor of this video. When it comes to wireless electric vehicle charging, all you need to know is one word, and that's Ytricity. Wireless charging brings a whole new level of convenience to the EV ownership experience by eliminating bulky cables and clunky connectors. Just park your vehicle and it starts absorbing energy automatically. Electricity technology will even support bi-directional and vehicle-to-grid charging so your EV can seamlessly feed electricity into your home or even the broader power network if there's an outage. Wireless EV charging by Electricity is easy elegant, and just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. So for more information, scan the on-screen QR code or hit the link in the description box below. Now, if you are old fashioned and don't have a Ytricity wireless charger, you'll almost certainly want a conventional 240 volt level two charger installed in your garage or carport, another EV expense. Yes, the charger itself costs money, but they're usually not that pricey. What could really cost you though, is the installation. Depending on your situation, you may have to run a new electrical line out to where you want to put the charger, and you may even have to upgrade your service panel, which could cost thousands of dollars, so be aware of that. Next, if you own an EV budget, a little extra money for tires. Thanks to their heavier curb weights and the instant torque their motors provide, electric vehicles put much more strain on tires, which wears them out faster. EVs also typically run special tires to improve efficiency, range, and NVH, so be aware of that, as replacement rubber can be more expensive as well. For a lot of drivers, another unexpected EV expense is resale value. When you go to trade in or sell your electric ride, you may find out it's not worth as much as you expected. Now this was a bigger issue a few years ago, but as technology improves, people get more familiar with EVs, and the zeitgeist evolves, it's becoming less of a problem. If you plan on making long distance drives in an electric, you'll almost certainly have to DC fast charge. And while this is usually significantly cheaper than buying gas or diesel, it's still pricier than juicing up at home, sometimes by a lot. According to the US Energy Information Administration, in January of 2023, the average cost per kilowatt hour of residential electricity in the US was 15.47 cents. But here in Michigan, it's just about 18 cents. The Electrify America DC fast charger we often use when gathering data for our EV Pulse charging challenge videos bilks drivers for 48 cents per kilowatt hour, though Pass Plus members who pay a $4 monthly fee do get it for just 36 cents. So if you were to completely replenish a Hyundai Ioniq 5 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack, it would cost about $14 to do it at home. Use an EA DC fast charger instead, and you could be shelling out more than $37, if you're not a member, of course. These elevated prices are unfortunate, but they do make sense. You're paying for speed and convenience, plus investors need to make back the money they shelled out to install the charger, which can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And finally, one unexpected expense of owning an EV is time. That is, the time it takes to charge. Whether you're replenishing the battery at home or juicing up at a DC fast charger, it's never as quick as filling a fuel tank. The Ionic 5 I mentioned earlier can go from 10 to 80% in just 18 minutes and incredible performance, but that's still way longer than gassing up, say, a comparable Santa Fe SUV. Time spent waiting in the grocery store parking lot as your EV charges is time that could be spent doing more productive things, so take that into consideration. Okay, so I basically outlined most of the downsides to EV ownership, but I do not want to deter you from buying one of these vehicles. They have real and significant advantages over gas and diesel-powered cars and trucks. 
Electrics are much cheaper to operate. You'll save a lot of money compared to buying fuel. And their maintenance costs are appreciably lower as well. And those two points can offset many of the unexpected expenses covered in this video. Aside from those points, EVs offer strong performance. They're smooth and nearly silent, have zero tailpipe emissions, are far better for the environment, and electrics often come with the latest and greatest features. So if you love new tech, they're really the only way to go. Do you know how to be a good electric vehicle owner? Well, up next I'll run down the do's and don'ts of charging etiquette, rules you should follow. Welcome to another episode of EV Basics. Charging electric vehicles is a different experience than fueling up a conventional car or truck, and a lot of drivers are new to all of it. To help you avoid any faux pas, here are 10 simple do's and don'ts to make sure everyone has a good charging experience. Tip number one, do use the appropriate charging speed for your vehicle. If you drive, say, a Chevy Bolt that DC fast charges at a maximum of around 55 kilowatts, there's absolutely no reason to plug into a 350 kilowatt charger. Your car's battery will not juice up any quicker, and you will piss off any Hummer EV or Hyundai eGMP drivers that need to DC fast charge. So know what your vehicle is capable of and use the appropriate hardware. Next up, don't DC fast charge to 100% unless you absolutely have to. There are situations where this might be necessary, but they're pretty rare in everyday use. Most EVs charge the quickest from 10 to 80%, and beyond this range, the speed plummets, meaning that getting the last 20% can take longer than the previous 70. Look at the Hyundai Ioniq 5, for instance. In our testing, it DC fast charged from 10 to 80% in a lickety split 18 minutes, exactly like the manufacturer says. But going from 80 to 100% required 32 additional minutes. So be courteous and avoid hogging a charger if you don't need to, even though that's exactly what we do while testing, so don't be like us. Tip number three, do move your vehicle as quickly as reasonably possible when finished charging so you're not blocking other drivers. Few things are more frustrating than waiting to re-energize your EV and there's another vehicle in the way, one that's done charging. Now operators disincentivize this outlet obstructing by charging users idle fees when they're plugged in and not juicing up, but still, be courteous and vacate the stall as soon as you reasonably can. Also, don't unplug other EVs. Just like you should have been taught as a child, keep your hands to yourself and don't touch other people's stuff. Now, it doesn't matter if a vehicle is at 97% or even if charging is complete. Be kind and don't interrupt another person's session, even if they need to learn about points two and three in this video. When you're done charging, do put the cable back where it belongs. Connectors oftentimes click into a holster on the power dispenser's cabinet, and doing this keeps the plug end and much of the cable up off the ground where these parts are less likely to get dirty or damaged. Please don't lazily dump the cable onto the asphalt where the next person could run it over because that is not good for anyone. Now it is worth noting, however, that sometimes Tesla owners do leave supercharger cables unhooked if the station doesn't work, and this is a way of signaling the problem to other drivers. But you know something? Wireless charging from Wytricity, the sponsor of this video, means you never have to wrestle with connectors or cables again. This makes the electric vehicle ownership experience simpler and far more convenient. You just park and your EV starts charging automatically. But that's not all. This system is also safer than plugging in, and it's just as efficient as level two charging with a cable. You're going to want Wytricity wireless charging in your next EV, so for more information, scan the on-screen QR code or follow the link in the description box below. Of course, we thank Wytricity for their support of EV Basics. Alrighty, tip number six, don't public charge unless you need to. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're driving to the grocery store, then Heading home after shopping and your battery's at like 95%, maybe don't take up a DC fast charger that another driver might need. 
The U.S. public charging infrastructure is still a regrettably finite resource, so if you've got plenty of range and you're just heading home, think of other motorists that might need to charge more than you do. Next, do unhitch your trailer while charging. Yes, this can be a major pain, but unless the parking lot where the chargers are located is massive or otherwise empty, it's courteous to disconnect your trailer while charging so you don't block traffic or access to other chargers. Again, try to be a good human being. I know that's hard sometimes. Along the same line, don't use a non-Tesla charger if you drive a Muskmobile. Tesla owners, you already have access to what is hands down the best charging network in the U.S. Tesla superchargers are plentiful, reliable, and incredibly convenient. So please don't feel the need to power up at an EVgo charge point or electrify America station unless you absolutely have to. Try to save those brand agnostic options for other EV drivers, and I can assure you they will thank you. Tip number nine, do exercise common courtesy. When charging, park neatly between the lines so you don't block access for others. Avoid cranking your music to obnoxious levels while chilling and charging, and definitely don't leave any garbage behind in the parking lot. A little thoughtfulness goes a long way toward making the EV experience a positive one for all drivers. And finally, if you can help it, don't use the same charger as another driver. Of course, this is not always possible, so use your judgment, but avoid plugging into the same charging cabinet as someone else. Many chargers are load balanced, meaning they share a certain amount of power. So if you start pulling electricity from the same cabinet, you could significantly reduce the other driver's charging speed. And again, this is not always possible, but use a separate charger if you can. And there you have it, 10 do's and don'ts of charging etiquette. To recap, do use an appropriate charger for your vehicle. Don't DC fast charge to 100% unless you need to. Do move your vehicle as quickly as reasonably possible when finished charging. Don't unplug other EVs. Do put the charging cable back where it belongs. Don't public charge unless you need to. Do unhitch your trailer while charging. Don't use a non-Tesla charger if you drive a Muskmobile. Do exercise common courtesy, something that applies to a lot more than just EV charging. And lastly, if you can help it, don't use the same charger as another driver. Thanks so much, and please try to follow these rules so everyone can have a positive EV charging experience. Next, watch the discussion I had with Ram's Chief of Interior Design about the Revolution concept. He gave us some clues as to what we might expect in the Ram Rev's final design, and of course, click right over here to see what insights he had to offer.